Hey everyone, this is Kai Wehner from Confluent. This is part three of our three part series about building cloud native data warehouses and data lakes with data streaming. In the first section, we talked about data in motion versus data at rest and the differences and different use cases. In the second part, we discussed different lake house architectures. So also combining warehousing and data lakes and how to make it cloud native and also when to use it in real time and batch. So this is now a concrete example I want to show you. This is a little bit more like hands-on, right? You see how to build such a project. So we will see how to build a cloud native lake house architecture for predictive maintenance. In this case, we're using a connected car infrastructure, but this can be applied to any industry like retail, financial services, telco energy, and so on. So let me just start with a use case, right? So this is Audi, um, and Audi already four or five years ago presented at a former Kafka summit about how they have built their connected car infrastructure. The main idea is that you get data in from many data sources, especially in this case, of course, connected vehicles, huge volumes of data, streaming real-time data. But then on the other side, of course, you also need to connect to your CRM system, loyalty platform, payment platforms to build the use cases like not just swarm intelligence, which is more vehicle focused, but also then collaboration with partners for after sales and increasing revenue and so on. From an architecture perspective, Audi has built a scenario where they use data streaming around Kafka for data in motion. They also relied on Spark for data at rest, for using batch processing, for doing the analytics on historical data from all the cars in other systems. And they had other components like Cassandra, for example, for some other high availability transactional storage workloads. In the end, it's not surprising here, right, on a very high level. It's running in the cloud, that's also important. In the beginning, Audi already knew they had to roll out not just on AWS in Germany, but then also in the US, and also finally go to China, mainland, where there is no real AWS. Maybe a part of that, but not the same. So there it's more like Alibaba or Tencent Cloud. And this overall architecture is what we want to take a look at now, how to build such a system from scratch. And therefore, here you see the architecture. In part two of the series, we talked a lot about Kappa architecture and what's different from Lambda and Batch versus real time. So here you see the huge advantage of building a Kappa architecture. You have a real time integration and ingestion pipeline to build really a modern data flow. And with that, you can then connect any kind of system, any kind of technology and any kind of communication paradigm. So not everything is or will be batch, but you get in the data as fast as possible. Like in this case, the car data. And in this case, we're using a proxy, like typically you do that for the last mile for these kind of scenarios, like in automotive or in gaming, where you have millions of players or drivers. And then you use the data in different environments. At the top, you see, where we do some pre-processing on the raw data with KSQL. This is in motion while the data is flowing in, like transformation from the raw JSON format into a structured schema with protobuf or Afro, for example. Then we do some more filtering because not all the data is relevant but it's high volumes and costly. And then we use that data and get it into our data lake. In this case, we're using Spark ML Lab. So we're using Spark's features for machine learning. You could use, for example, Databricks in the cloud for that. And here we do our model training on historical data. So this is a batch process normally. However, we still consume from the streaming data. Even if it's consumed in batch or in near real time, that doesn't matter. But you don't need a separate batch pipeline for that. It's just one infrastructure for serving all the different consumers. We could also train another model like we did in our demo on GitHub actually, where we directly consume with Python and TensorFlow from Kafka. There is no need for another infrastructure for that. But here we're using Spark MLLib to train analytic models in our case that we build, we use an autoencoder to do anomaly detection on the car data. So that's a batch process that runs once a week or once a day for hours, and then you get a new model. This is a batch workload with pretty low SLAs because if it's down, we just restart it. But then we need to deploy this model for real-time predictions on incoming car engine data so that we can act in real time. This is a super critical process. It has run 24 seven at any scale for millions of cars on the streets. This is deployed at the top right. This is a Kafka Streams application, a small microservice that runs in the Kafka environment with all the characteristics you know from Kafka, high scale, failover, built-in, no downtime, low latency. That's the things what Kafka 
does, right? So that we can do the model scoring inside the Kafka application. The model deployment is completely separated from the model training. It has very different SLAs and requirements. But in the end, we use the same pipeline for getting the data in there. The model deployment consumes it in low latency in milliseconds in real time from the car via the Kafka broker. And the model training in the middle, that takes it in near real time or batch whenever you start a new model, right? They are completely separated regarding SLAs and latency and cost. And in parallel to this predictive maintenance use case with two separate applications, one batch, one real time, we also do a near real time ingestion into a third system. In this case, we're using Spark SQL for reporting for business intelligence. But in many cases, this is not all built with one system like Spark. But reality is that your business domain probably says, no, I want something like MongoDB here or Elasticsearch, or I buy a software as a service product. I don't even want to configure my reporting. I want to have a built product for a specific industry. This is again completely truly decoupled from the other systems. So why is it working so well? Because Kafka is not just a messaging layer. Check out the first part of the series if you want to learn more. Because Kafka is also a storage system for true decoupling to handle slow consumers and replayability. And it's also for data integration and data processing. So you're very flexible about how to deploy this in such an architecture. You have the freedom of choice to choose the right tool or product or software service for your business domain. And now this is the architecture we have built also in a demo on GitHub. Again, the model training is a specific tool, like in this case Spark, or it could be TensorFlow or something else. You get the data in here, and then you find insights by using an algorithm. Like we used an unsupervised autoencoder in our example to detect anomalies. This is a complex batch process, and this is what the data science team builds, typically with Python and with Jupyter Notebooks, for example. And after the model is trained, we need to deploy it. Here's an example where we deploy the Spark ML lib model within a Kafka application, in this case using KSQL. So we build a user-defined function for KSQL, and here we embedded the analytic model. A model is just a binary, you can train it everywhere, like with Spark, with TensorFlow, with a cloud service, and then deploy it somewhere else with very different SLAs and latency and cost and so on. And in this case, we're doing the animal detection on every single incoming event from the car. And this is millions of events. We can run this at scale, mission critical with low latency, completely separate from the model training. And this is key why I also in the second part explained why a lake house is not just one infrastructure, it shouldn't be. It's a combination and a logical view of components. Choose the right tool for the job. And then also, um, because the, the whole series is about building cloud native applications, right? Um, obviously, more and more people are going to the cloud with that where possible. And so cloud native to me means that it's really elastic infrastructure and faster time to market. You use containers, DevOps, GitOps, and all these automation tools to not just deploy software, but also to test it, to scale it up, to scale it down, and so on. And Kubernetes clearly won this war. So most elastic cloud native infrastructures, both on the provider side, like if you buy Confluent Cloud, you don't see that, but under the hood, it's running on Kubernetes, right? But on the other side, also when you build your own applications, like a predictive maintenance app, running with Kafka, with Spark ML Lab, and so on. And what's super important when we now talk about all these cutting edge lake houses and cloud systems, well, what I don't like is that most vendors use the terms like serverless or fully managed SaaS, as a marketing term, even though they don't do that. Because most solutions on the market in the data infrastructure level, like around Apache Kafka, are not fully managed, actually. You just get software provisioned, like the brokers for Zookeeper and for Kafka, and then you operate and manage it by yourself. You have to fix the bugs by yourself. You have to do the performance tuning by yourself. That's not fully managed and serverless. That's partially managed. And that's reality in most Kafka services these days. And it's true also for a lot of analytics platforms built on open source. So always check out if a service is really truly fully managed with a consumption-based model where you get the right SLAs for your critical services and support and tooling around that. This is critical when we talk about a cloud-native Lakehouse enterprise architecture for both the data streaming part and the data at rest parts like a warehouse or a data lake. Here are just two examples for truly cloud-native warehouses where the solutions are fully managed. In this case, we are combining Confluent Cloud for the data streaming part with Snowflake as the data warehouse. And even more important, also the connectivity and integration between the systems is fully managed. So this is where you also see that 
as I said in the first part of the series, data at rest and data in motion are complementary. They have very different capabilities and features. Yes, they overlap for 10%, right? So sometimes you have a choice, but in most cases, it's clear who's the, the strongest solution for a problem. Like data streaming is typically something like Confluent Cloud. Data warehousing is something like Snowflake because that's what they do best. And the integration is also built in because these uh, companies work together to certify and fully manage the integration. Like in this case, with a fully managed Snowflake connector from Confluent, certified by Snowflake. And the story is the same for other vendors, right? Like here in this case, we're using Confluent together with Databricks for building a lake house architecture. And as I said also in the earlier parts of the video, well, this works very well, but in most cases, there is not just one, you call it lake house or data lake for all the data. You choose the right tool for the job. And sometimes Elastic or Mongo or Snowflake is better for the problem. And this is why the streaming hub is so strong in the middle, truly decoupling the systems. And so each downstream consumer can then choose and pick the data they want. It can be the raw data, or it can be pre-processed data that the streaming platform already curates for you. This is always a question about favorite tooling, about cost, about latency, about SLAs to make these decisions. There is no single solution that fits all use cases here, and also typically not a single vendor that fits all use cases. And so even more important then, when we talk about really cloud native, hybrid or global deployments, data replication is critical, not just for a single cluster, but for more of them. And this is true both for data streaming, real-time data replication, and for data at rest with a database, with a warehouse, with a lake. You often need to replicate some of the data between on-prem and cloud, or across different regions or continents within one cloud, or even across multiple cloud providers from AWS to GCP to Azure or Alibaba. And there's different use cases for that, like just data sharing for business perspective or disaster recovery and high availability. The tooling is there from all the vendors. You get this from Confluent Cloud, like we have cluster linking, for example, or open source as MirrorMaker for that with Kafka. In the data lake or warehouse world with Databricks, with Mongo, with Snowflake, they can also replicate data at rest. So it's super critical to understand when you need to replicate data now or when you can also replicate it later at rest in the storage system and what's better for you and make the decisions based on that. But you need to be aware that both is, op is possible and choose the right option for replicating data for the different use cases in motion or at rest. And there are so many architectures for this. There's not just one architecture. It depends on your SLAs, on your cost, on your compliance requirements. And with that, keep in mind, talk to different experts from different vendors and open source experts and community so that you can get the right architecture for your problem. I work mostly in the Kafka space, so I've seen so many wrong architectures here where you could lose data even so you are not allowed from a compliance perspective or where you had a lot of latency issues because you didn't architect it in the right regions and so on. And then on the other side, replicating across regions, unfortunately, egress is very, very expensive in contrary to ingress. So you need to find the right architecture depending on your problem. And in most cases in a cloud native lake house, you need to think about that both from the streaming data and motion perspective and from the storage and data at rest perspective and how to combine them the right way. And in the end, the final goal of a lake house or warehouse or data lake is to provide the right data products from your business perspective. So you don't focus anymore on just the technology first, but build a business problem to increase revenue, reduce cost, reduce risk, improve the customer experience. And based on that, we built today what's called a data mesh, right? That's the newest buzzword here. It's in the end a combination of microservices and data marts and domain-driven design and streaming and so on. So the basic rule of thumb is still choose the right product under the hood for solving your business problem the best way. And this can then be anything. Like in this example, a Kafka streaming application as a KSQL service. But you can choose this per domain and that's a great thing. And this is where Kafka helps so much by decoupling the systems and also by replicating across regions in real time so that even in another region or in another data center, you can still choose as a business side. Do I want to consume it directly from the stream or do I want to put it into Databricks or into a snowflake for doing reporting? That's where you have then the freedom of choice. But this only works if a modern data warehouse infrastructure has a streaming layer so that you replicate data in real time and then later can decide real time or batch. If you first store it at rest and then put a streaming layer on top of that, that doesn't work. 
right? Because if you build a Spark structured streaming app, for example, but first you consume the data from a S3 object store, that's not a data in motion anymore. It's already addressed. For some use cases, it's good enough, but not for all of them. If you need low latency and mission critical workloads. And keep this in mind. So a data mesh is great for decentralized data products. And typically it's not a single vendor. It's a combination of data streaming, data addressed with different vendors and technologies and cloud services. With that, thanks for watching this three part series. I hope you learned a lot about data streaming and warehousing and lake houses and how they complement each other. Data at rest and data in motion are complementary. The tools are a little bit overlapping, but typically you find the right vendor for the right product, right? And then you combine them the right way. Thanks for watching.